let's get on track with motorsport in the electric age. I'm Roger Atkins, and this is my conversation with industry experts to talk about just how we might reconcile a glorious past with an innovative and truly challenging future. We'll discuss what the core issues are and where opportunity might be racing towards us. What prospective solutions could be in pole position to help us tackle climate change and much more besides? I'll be asking if the racing romance of over 70 years of Formula One can truly deliver relevant progress for the future. How can Formula One and Formula E together with the rest of motorsport deliver technological progress and fabulous entertainment? It's 2031. Can I still go and watch a Formula One race? And will Lewis Hamilton still be racing? <laughs> I don't know about the last part of that. Yeah, okay. that's, that's up to Lewis. But, yeah. um, uh, Formula One is about, um, uh, is about great sport. Mm. So if we can uh, position Formula One so it continue, can continue to be great sport, yeah. um, if we can make sure that um, the regulations um, are in a place which means that the technology that's being used is relevant, if we can do those things, then we will have earned the right to exist. Yeah. Now, I, everything I see suggests that those are the ways that the whole industry wants to go in. So I'm pretty sure, yeah, 2031, you'll be able to see F1 cars going around. We see this future coming towards of, of electrification. Um, and some people say, is it electric or eclectic? in terms of the different things that are coming towards us. The romance and the heritage and all the things that have been there with Formula One for, what, 70 odd years, um, are, are deeply embedded in the psyche of lots of people. So it's a question of, you know, romance versus reality, you know, re the realism of the future challenges. I've read in a few places recently, Alessandro Gag, and people might say, well, he would say this, wouldn't he? Wants to blend or thinks Formula One and Formula E should come together at some point. Um, we live in a tribal world to mm. a great extent. And I know the Formula One tribe, if you like, are like hands up in horror at that prospect. Um, and maybe some of the Formula E a uh, lot as well. What's your view? You've been in both. Is there a way or either could it, should it, will it happen that these things will merge at some point in time? So I suppose there's a few aspects of that when you think that actually you know, a lot of the technology that's in the Formula E cars came from Formula One teams like McLaren and Williams. Then yes. you could say already we've got uh, an element of Formula One inside of Formula E. Maybe changes over the future where Formula One gets more and more electrification, I could imagine that. Uh, Formula E itself obviously in the next generation is going to go from the current 250 kilowatts of power under uh, regen and um, under power in qualifying. And then we'll go to 350 kilowatts for drive, 250 extra kilowatts regen on the front wheels. That's getting 600 kilowatts of regen wow. in, in Formula E. So Formula E is getting huge jumps in, in power and, and regeneration of electricity. So how does it all come together in the future? I think, again, it's horses for courses. Will, the, will Formula One use denser fuel storage like, uh, like a hydrogen or a, a gasoline? Um, I don't think they'll go fully battery electric. I think they'll be probably a hybrid and yeah. maybe in Formula E we stay as, a, uh, as battery. So long story short, will they come together? I don't know, but I do believe that, um, that the drivetrain will be electric because it's more controllable and you can do more things with an electric drivetrain. So there's going to be this combination of sort of more energy being re harvested, uh, more probably electrification on the vehicle but then the energy carrier and how you convert that energy to, to power, let's say, on, on the car. Not quite sure exactly because yeah. we're all focusing on different things. Tricky, I think the, the, the different beasts really, they, they need to, um, they, they've got different challenges. Uh, so I'd say perhaps not yet, but what, what, who knows what the future brings, but yeah, they may, they, they've got different challenges ahead of them. Yeah. Um, they've got compromises that we don't have and, and, and vice versa. So uh, we do share the same passion, the same culture, the same processes, the same attention to detail that, that we've grown within HPP. And I think that's one of the big differentiators of things we do here, really. 
I think the difference between Formula One and Formula E, though, is Formula One's been at the pinnacle of, of motorsport for 70 plus years. Um, Formula E, we're now in our seventh season. Um, and in that sense, we're still very much a, a startup. I'm absolutely confident that it'll become something which globally um, is seen as a, um, I suppose, the pinnacle of electric motorsport. We race in streets in cities, so we're downtown in tighter tracks. Formula One obviously is yeah. in sort of the big classic um, flowing tracks like yes. uh, uh, Monza's or, or other places like that. So because when you're going at a higher speed, you're, you're burning more energy, but it doesn't really add to the spectacle. And in city tracks, um, they're a lot shorter, so therefore we have um, uh, shorter straights. Uh, the Formula E car could do something like 270 kilometers an hour, but it's optimized for about 230. In the race itself, uh, the driver has to save about 30% of energy in order to do the full race distance. So they've really, got a lot much? of work. Yeah. yeah, And that's why you see it so much more overtaking because as they're saving energy, there's also a possibility that the person behind them doesn't have to save energy and can go past them more easily because the person who's saving the energy has to lift off and go into regen earlier in order to save that energy. But the guy that's behind them might have one, 2% more energy. Yeah. And he's like, okay, I can use my extra energy now yeah. to go past you. So you, you could argue being a Formula E driver is harder than being a Formula One driver in that sense. You've got to, you've got to be doing all these computations as in, you know, the telemetry isn't, isn't doing it for you, is it? And then the last aspect I find is that because in a normal race weekend, you're over three days. So you start on the Friday, you yeah. do a bunch of testing, you do qualifying on Saturday and you race on Sunday. There's time to come up to the, to the level. Maybe yeah. Lewis Hamilton's on it straight away, but there may yeah. be some drivers that take a bit longer to get up. But in Formula E, it all happens in one day. So it, it favors what I call explosive talent. So yeah, people that yeah. can just arrive and deliver and not have any mistakes and, and go on to the race. So maybe the next time you're looking at selecting drivers, you should ask them these two questions. Can you tightrope walk and can you juggle? <laughs> yeah. And could you do both of those at the same time? Not a bad ask question for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of our fans actually, I think, are actual are Formula One fans who enjoy the technology in both, in yes. both areas. The audience last year, I think, was over a billion for watching Formula One on TV. Um, there is a desire for a long-term Formula One future. Fast, noisy, exciting racing. Um, but like I said, is, is that just a romantic notion uh, from yesterday that's just going to be swept away tomorrow by, you know, this ubiquitous electric vehicle world? What do you, what do you think, Jeff? I think there's a number of dimensions to this. Now, we've got an emotional connection with our personal transport, yeah. uh, which is why we like uh, high performance vehicles and we like things that express our personality mm. but a lot of our personal transport we it needs now to have minimum environmental impact it needs to be quiet it needs to be safe mm. in fact we're embracing uh, assisted driving or uh, autonomous driving whereas motorsport is staying with that emotional side which is yeah. saying it needs to be exciting it needs to be challenging and particularly we like the man machine interface it yeah. needs to be seen to be hard it needs to be something where we think I don't think I could do that myself. It needs mm. to be you know, inspirational. Now, I think the drive line itself, the powertrain we use, whether it's internal combustion engine or, or hybrid or fully electric, I don't think that really is quite so important. It's having that feeling of seeing something that you don't know quite how they've managed to do it. Yeah, definitely. On, on the edge, I mean, that, that, that for me, and I think many people that love motorsport, it's that, it's that point at which people are going to the very edge of capability of, of the vehicle, the, the bike or the car or whatever, um, and doing things that we would all like to think we could do, but we, we know we can't. Are we likely at some point to see, to see autonomy capable of that? Or is that, the, is that the absolutely raggy edge of human capability? And is autonomy more about city-based, slower moving, you know, delivery trucks and things and whatever? What's your view on that? We all enjoy watching people battling on tracks, yeah. so I think that's, um, that's one of the elements. I mean, that's, you know, when you think about Formula E, we've even done things like the driver has to tell us how much energy is left in the car in order to make it harder. Yeah, you haven't so, got telemetry, have you? No. No, so no, that's, no, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so that's deliberate by yeah. the FIA in order to make it harder for the driver and makes it more spectacular for us yeah, watching. No, no. Do you think Formula One has kind of kept the same pace of, of of technology advancement in and around power management, energy management, batteries, 
compared and contrasted to Formula E, because we're now coming up to Gen 3 cars, and there's some big leaps coming in all of this. So who's winning that technology race? When you look at how we got to Formula E, you've got to remember that the first cars were basically done by McLaren and Williams. So Williams right. did the battery from knowledge they got from Kurs. So F1 technology course, had fed yeah, into, yeah. into Formula E. I think if Formula One hadn't been pushing Kurs at the time, the may not have been the supply chain and other aspects that were needed to make the transition to an electric uh, race car. Formula One is a, a sport defined by regulations, that's mm. what the word formula means. Mm. Uh, and the first hybridisation started mm. in 2009. Nine. Yep. You know, we, we wrote the rules that were packaged up and called the Kurz system. Mm. We, we forget now, but when it was first defined, we all thought that the right solution would be to store energy in flywheels, because batteries at that stage were so poor yeah. You know, they were good enough for a phone, yeah. mobile phone, but the idea of using them to deliver 60 horsepower, yeah. that, that would have been a battery the size of, of your living room. <laughs> That's so, not going to work, is it? That's so it was never going to work. But yeah. the fact that that opportunity was made available to the talented engineers and the budgets that they have to deploy to other talented engineers in specialist companies, mm. such as battery technologists and so on, mm created terrific advances in, in those technologies back in those just two or three years yeah. to produce electrical solutions for cars uh, and batteries that, that weren't the size of your living room but were actually, would fit in a Formula One car and deliver Yeah, the, real technology panels. accelerator. Yeah. So let me just get this right. 2009, first Formula One win in a cars powered car. It was Lewis Hamilton. You would have been, were you on the pit wall then? What, what he had? It was a great day because actually, uh, you know, I was at McLaren in those years and, and we'd had a very tough year actually because we came out of the blocks. Uh, we were literally the worst team uh, at the beginning of the season. Right. So it was a point of great pride that by the time we got to Hungary, which mm. was, you know, this, the late summer, we won our first race that year mm. on merit. Uh, Lewis Hamilton's overtake on Mark Webber was was a curse assisted right. overtake, right. which took him from second to first. So and Mark Webber wasn't so happy about that moment. Though, no, because he? <laughs> he didn't have a curse. <laughs> yeah. So in those days, not everybody had curse. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Mercedes had done a terrific job. Yeah. It was the best curse in the uh, in the whole paddock. There were, yes. Well, there were only were two or three. Can I just say as a motorsport fan, and particularly Formula One fan, you know, I like the sound. I like, of course, the speed and that absolutely taking it to the edge, both of technology and in driving performance. There is a lot of focus now and discussion about how can Formula One progress given this accelerated you know, electric vehicle proposition. How do you now reconcile what's coming towards us? The point with the, with the current power unit, it was introduced in 2014, you know, around 2012 and those sort of times. And what we've been doing ever since then is really pushing um, the boundaries of what you can achieve with combustion in terms of its thermal efficiency. Yeah. And we've been working so hard on the, uh, on the electrification during that period as well. Um, the sort of work that we were doing is really starting to, to drop as people are having to be innovative in order to um, uh, be part of that journey towards mm. the electrification while still not really having the electrification technology in a place where it can right now take over. Hmm. So the hybrid engines in Formula One introduced in 2014 are now 50% thermally efficient. Uh, and this is nothing hmm. to do with recovery under braking. This right. is in steady state. So steady state down the straight. Yeah. So they're taking energy out of the exhaust. Right. Uh, and recovering that. So it's effectively heat energy that would have been wasted. Right. They're recovering that electrically and they're replaying that electrically into the crankshaft. Mm. So this has boosted the efficiency initially in 2014 to 44% thermally efficient. And in six years, they've pretty much improved by 1% per year, mm. which is incredible. If you think it is. the internal combustion engine in, in the road cars that we generally use today, 
they have gone perhaps from 20%, 25 to 30% in a period of 100 years. So, you know, what's been done in Formula One with hybrid engines and their efficiency is incredible. Yeah, it's... And, and has a part to play in, in, in a future system. You know, can we get to 60%, 70%? How far can we actually go, theoretically? Uh, yeah, frankly, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> um, I think um, there will be some fundamental limits. Yes. Um, in, in, which will be driven by the physics. But um, they will keep pushing forward. You know, obviously Formula One is, is something that's been around for a long time. So there's going to be a lot of, of flow of information, if you like, from that direction towards the Formula E group. Um, although interestingly, we've actually already seen some of the work that we've done on the Formula E um, power unit, especially transferring back into the current Formula One um, power unit. So I think actually there's going to be mutual benefit on both sides. Yeah, we're, we're, again, very lucky to be here, but it would be, uh, it'd be wrong if there wasn't some healthy competition amongst that as well. We are chasing efficiency, pure efficiency, and then that's, that's, what, that's why it's enjoyable, yeah. I've heard about efficiency figures up to 97% in the powertrain this season. So what can you tell us about that? The efficiency figures are, uh, I find mind blowing, you know, my, my, my background, it's, it's not, they don't teach you that at university, you know, so this is amazing. EV is amazing as a, as a, a powertrain efficiency, I find. Uh, they're actually currently talking about having no rear brakes, for example, uh, which is, a, that gives you an example of how we, you don't need to dissipate it to hit, you can just regen it to the pack. Uh, so, um, yeah, obviously we still got the front brakes. For safety, um, but there's always things like where um, if something was to happen, it's nice to have a bit of a, a bit of backup, <laughs> or if you live on top of the hill, or <laughs> so yeah. But I think it's, it's that, that journey in terms of, um, of defining the the efficient car, if you want, is quite well well planned with and well aligned with the Formula E journey. Yeah, well, the Formula E as a series has been um, net zero from 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 its inception, which is uh, which is pretty phenomenal. But I don't think we can ever rest on our laurels in that respect. We've always got to be pushing forward and making improvements as we go through. So we're constantly looking at topics such as the freight that we carry around, for example. Um, so away from the cars themselves, there are definitely things that we can do to uh, to continue to take those necessary steps forward. Because I think sustainability is something that is spoken about a lot, um, but it's actually the, the implementation of those measures that are going to make the difference and it's, it's key that we're, we're held accountable for that as well. You've got a big team, you've got a lot of people here. How do you now keep that team sort of motivated in, in progressing some of the combustion engine technology that, that you've talked about there? whilst they hear more and more announcements about electric this and electric that, how do you keep everyone buzzing, you know, so to speak? Uh, I don't think the future is quite as black and white mm. as, as can, be, um, uh, can be portrayed. And I think there is still a place, certainly along the journey, um, for some of the combustion um, technologies that, that we're involved in. The area which has grown um, more um, prevalent in the in the last little period is, is some of the changes in the fuels yeah because of the way that our sport is going um, we are going to be working on some of these fuels and the way that those yeah. can be integrated into combustion engines the one point something billion vehicles on the planet are going to be with us for another 20 30 years even by the time we get to these these cutoff points of internal combustion manufacture so we have to have solutions for mm. those vehicles you know, it does need innovation. Can I ask you something about, I heard Ross Braun say, um, I think it was last year, he said, um, I'm gonna quote it, Formula One can be a really strong figurehead in finding solutions for the billion plus internal combustion cars over the next few decades. Do, do you agree with Ross? Do you think it could be? The quick answer is not quite. I think, because I think there are two aspects to this. One, I think we actually have a solution to the billion IC mm -hmm. cars, which is we're going to stop making IC cars mm -hmm. largely. And I think land transport is going to have to go fully electric just yeah. from, uh, from climatic, from environmental reasons. 
But Formula One, of course, is much more than just designing an in internal combustion engine powered car. It's all yeah. about applying technology. It's about solving problems, solving people quickly. So the, half of his answer is completely correct. Yes, I think yeah. addressing the problems, Formula One is very well placed to address a whole lot of problems. The specific one about the internal combustion engine, I think, is largely going to be solved by saying, actually, we're only going to use it in very specific areas where we can afford it. Right. Uh, there's something on the table here. Now, I know they're not, they're, they're not samples that we've had to take for some <laughs> medical reason, uh, Paddy. Can you just tell us what, what we've got here and just talk, talk yeah. us through this? That is a synthetic gasoline. In a nutshell, petrosynthesis is about producing petroleum, synthetic petroleum, yeah. from renewable power, sun, yeah. wind. So just to be clear, whatever. nothing to do with oil? Oil has got nothing at all to do with this. Well, it is oil, but it's it's an oil that didn't come out of the ground. Okay. So right, petroleum, okay. petroleum, which has a bad name at the moment. Yeah. Totally wrongly, petroleum is a fantastic set of chemicals that we're all right. addicted to. Actually. Right. You know whether whether it's uh, you know in our toothpaste yes. tube or our, you know. But but don't you, you know so even you know all the the PPE we use in these yeah. COVID times. All the, these vaccines, you know, petrochemical industry yeah, has fed indeed. all of that supply and all that technology. Yes. The, the problem is not petroleum. The problem is fossil petroleum. So right, the okay. problem is that it comes from fossils. And we're, we're all hardwired to associate the two together. Yes. Hardwired to think. Yeah, I do. Petroleum yeah, I did. equals fossils. Yes. Equals, you know, work of the devil. <laughs> you know, no more of that. Yeah. You know, got to get away from yeah. that. Essentially, they're made from renewable power, renewable yeah. electricity. Yeah. So that uh, is fed into hydrogen electrolyzers. That hydrogen is, is itself already an intermediate fuel, mm. uh, much more suitable for storage than electricity um, and useful for a very wide range of, of applications. Mm. And, you know, the hydrogen economy has been talked about for many years and is actually, you know, gathering a lot of momentum interesting thing about synthetic petroleums is that the, you know what's leveled against it all the time is the cost mm. what, why is that is it well of scale i think or frankly it? it's because fossil fuels are just you know, ridiculously cheap yeah uh, and you know incredible energy density mm. fossil fuels sell for less than milk Red Bull, yeah. water, bottled water in a bottle. Yeah, no, you're exactly. right. Yeah, I'm it's outrageous. That. Yeah, yeah. So when when people say synthetic petroleums are too expensive, what they mean is we live in a very distorted economy where the the cost of a fuel which was developed by nature over literally hundreds and hundreds mm. of millions of years, mm. and we are consuming without really reflecting that value. We know how much it will cost to mm. make a synthetic gasoline or synthetic jet fuel. And, and you're looking at it, it's mm. all in the plant. Mm. Okay. Uh, downstream from that, there's no cost because this is an identical drop in replacement to our current fuel systems. So mm. all your distribution, storage, all your vehicles have no new cost because all those assets carry on business as usual. Mm. The, the problem with electrification is we don't actually know the cost of delivering all our electrification yeah. because it, it, it feeds into, you know, upscaling the grid, mm. upscaling all the supply side, uh, charging up a points, lot of minerals and that we haven't yet. Digging yep. up minerals yep. that we don't know where they, they come yeah. from. So the, the cost of total electrification is unquantifiable at the moment. Yes. So what I would advocate is a balance. Uh, we need a balance. There are three energy media, mm. electrification, hydrogen, mm. hydrocarbon, liquid fuels. Yeah. Yeah. They each have their merits. This, you know, you start the most efficient, it gets less and less efficient as you go down that, through that sequence. Yeah. Um, but it becomes more and more dense, more and more portable, uh, and, you know, the utility goes up, yeah. let's say. So, and different vehicles will need different things. But given what you said earlier about anything's possible given time and money in Formula One, 
and you could argue expand that into everything, mm. anything. How can we perhaps improve those other those metrics on those things that at the moment are pretty much dismissed by a lot of people? You know, so thin, synthetic fuels for motorsport, hydrogen in a number of things. What's your flavour? You, I mean, you go around the world with Formula E. What are you learning or seeing in other countries that maybe give you a sense of what could change? And I think one element of motorsports is we can take more risk because when you're doing a road car, it's got to be on the road for 15 years. But when you're doing a race car, then, you know, in terms of hardware, that only has to last one year in, yeah. in Formula One uh, well, in, and in Formula E, the, the changes are coming so quickly that you can experiment, you can experiment fast, you can make mistakes, you can prototype things. I often call motorsports a prototyping competition. And so, you know, the change that can be pushed and showcased uh, through F1 and through Formula E and through Le Mans is incredible. And I think if we have a target about what we're trying to achieve, get that efficiency up of these, um, of the transfer from energy, electrical energy into uh, liquid, liquid, uh, yeah, yeah. liquid fuels, I think um, be amazed. A car that I think fascinated a lot of people, the Mercedes SLS electric drive, you know, a project which I guess must have begun in terms of R&D terms at least a decade ago, if not 11, you know, 12 years ago. That looked like really class leading electric vehicle capability. Was that leveraged in, in what we're seeing today? It feels, if you don't mind me saying so, a little yeah. bit like it could have been a lost opportunity, like you had a lead there as a, as a business and then Perhaps you just, you didn't so much. That was a great project. Mm. That was a great project. Um, and it was very much taking the technology that had been developed from the, from the Formula One motor and inverter side and, and really did use that technology. On the battery side, not so much. The battery side was, was kind of a, a, a new development. It didn't really use the technologies that we had. Yeah. Um, I think we learned an incredible amount um, from that, that battery technology and, and, the, and the cell technology. Um, and and uh, have we leveraged it? I'm, I guess um, from, a, uh, uh, from a product point of view, mm. perhaps not. No, I suppose mm. you're right. But there, mm. isn't, there wasn't a, a, there wasn't a follow up. Yeah. I think we learned a significant amount about the technology though. Um, mm. We also learned a lot about trying to make more than race engines and yeah. race PUs and some of the things that we learned there being put back into the Project One program. So I think we probably learned more about how to do the, those sorts of projects than perhaps yes. the, uh, taking the technology forward and doing more of them. Yeah. There is a slight difficulty we got at the moment is that if you're in a motorsport application then you're very much focused in terms of battery technology on high, um, en uh, high power density. Yes. Whereas for your range, for your um, yeah. utility high vehicle, energy your high energy yeah, density. Absolutely. And at yeah. the moment the chemistry appears to be slightly diverging between those two. Yeah. Now this is not to say that we won't find a solution that yes. realigns them and I, yeah. that would certainly be a, a, a hugely useful step. I think we need to remain relevant. Um, so we spoke before about engaging with the audience. I'm confident that that will continue to grow. So I think the steps are being made in the right direction. But we are, you know, to use the words you've just used, trying to do more with, with less. I feel that there's lots of crossover and, and, and things we could implement on the road car. I mean, when I'm driving, I'm thinking, well, I could lift now, which is what the driver does. We tell, him, we tell the driver when he can lift in a straight to be efficient but quick. Uh, but it's quite hard to know as a driver, everyday driver, when do you have to, to lift or brake to not waste too much energy. So I think there's a few things and it's, it's something we're trying to do with the EQXX project perhaps as, a, as, as transferring that knowledge of informally we could do that. But imagine increasing your range by a third. That would be quite a big enabler, isn't it? So Can you give us any kind of glimpse, particularly around ener energy storage, of any kind of novel battery concepts or things that you're involved in? that you're allowed to tell me. If I, if I put the um, sort of motor racing Formula One hat on, not a great deal really. Okay. Um, the, the regulations in Formula One have been pretty static for a long time. Right. Um, and the, um, the way that the ERS system, the electrical system mm. is regulated 
uh, once you're able with your battery to do everything that the regulations allow you to do, there's really very little um, uh, incentive mm. to go forward with that, which is, uh, which is the choice the industry's made. Mm. We have got some good knowledge from some of the projects that you've talked about mm. um, in the past, and, and we continue to do um, some really good close work with, with Mercedes in their R&D areas, projects that we're currently doing um, with, uh, with battery technology is, is on the EQXX platform. Right. So the kind of platform to get up towards a thousand kilometers on a single charge. Mm. Um, and we're doing the work here on integrating uh, the batteries, uh, the cells uh, into a, a larger battery pack and mm. into the car. So I'm not an advocate of synthetic petroleum solutions only. I see too much one-way thinking. Yeah, know. yeah. It's, um, it's simplistic, it's binary, it's, it's, yeah. it doesn't take into account unintended consequences, supply chain challenge. Correct. If you look at the, the reality ar ar around where we are with technology to power up electric vehicles, if you look at direct charging, 73% efficient. Um, if you then look at maybe switching to hydrogen, maybe yep. not 22% efficient. Um, and power to liquid then is, is way down, that's 13%. So I, I do believe that the electric drivetrain will win in the end because you've got much more controllability of an electric drivetrain. But then what is the energy carrier might change depending on where you are in the world. So if you're in a place like France, which has a lot of nuclear power, then it's obvious direct, uh, direct electrification to a, a battery electric vehicle should be probably the most efficient thing in, in France. But if you're in a place like where I'm from, Australia, which has a huge, vast um, spaces, but you need to take the energy from maybe the center of Australia to the, the capital cities, which are on the, on the edge, the way you transfer that energy might be turning it into a liquid, um, which is then a synthetic fuel, which maybe yeah. then gets transferred to a an internal combustion engine that might be burning ammonia or, as you say, hydrogen or yeah. another aspect. So I think, Horses for courses. Obviously, we have a lot of um, plug-in hybrids at the moment, where you use electric for the to be clean in the in the middle of the cities, but for the longer distances, they switch to um, to gasoline, for example, and that could be renewable in the future. So I think what's the great about engineering is you can come up with all sorts of different solutions to things that we don't know the answer to right now. The binary approach of just battery electric vehicles, full stop. I actually think the more I'm learning about minerals and mining, mm. mineral processing, battery management and battery development, the more I'm actually quite concerned that if we put, literally put all our eggs in one basket, we could end up in a bit of a mess. Um, it doesn't feel like that way in the popular narrative that people talk. It's as though that's it, battery electric vehicles, full stop. Yeah. So when I mentioned earlier eclectic or electric, I do think that's where we are. And what resides within Formula One capability, the engineering finesse of, of technology to a point of you know, fantastic performance and sustainability, because um, for a lot of people it seems incongruous. You can't talk about Formula One and sustainability in the same breath. I think you can. I think you can. And, and I think increasingly the more you do, the more we can see it develop and, and progress. Of course, fundamentally, a lot of this is about um, entertainment but also education and, of course, climate change, air quality. You cannot and must not you know, detach those things fr from that journey. But nonetheless, I, I, I really believe, and I've used this phrase a few times with a few people we've mm. talked to, that we just must avoid, be careful that we don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm. Yep. You know, in thinking, let's go for a zero-sum game, never use a combustion engine car again for anything, you know, even if we're using synthetic fuels, perhaps, mm. and, and, and just, you know, we, be, we, we just go to a pure electric everything. Um, I can understand people feeling that is where we'll go inevitably, but I personally think that w that's not needed, it's not necessarily, and if we do take that route, I think it will be personally a bit of a loss. I've worked here for uh, 16, 17 years. Um, there is uh, an incredible group of people, yeah. an incredible group of people here, and they are all completely passionate yes. about what they do yes. um, and, and what they need to do in order to achieve, and everybody here mm. works with that level of responsibility because mm. they all want to be um, part of a team that can win. Um, and using all that knowledge that we've gained from various different projects and pulling that all together. And not mm. just the engineering um, knowledge and the technical knowledge, <coughs> but actually the how, do you, how the hell do you go about 
the project. Yeah. How do you take the way that we in racing in Formula One approach a project and, and put that into the road car uh, environment as, uh, and so you can accelerate the rate in which these technologies get, um, mm. get, get brought into the, uh, into the mainstream? That is the stuff I wanted people to hear, exactly as you just explained it. Because like I said earlier on about throwing the baby out with the bathwater, capability at this end of technology and innovation and, and automotive is, is, is profound. Mm. Uh, and, and it's great to hear that. So this challenge of tackling climate change, which is the challenge of our time, there cannot be any greater challenge th th than that. You know, it's complex. I think more complex than people perhaps realize or, or give it credit for, and it's absolutely urgent. So might we see a lot of the application of that science and technology you're in charge of coming to deal with some of this stuff? So the quick answer is yes, Formula One, I believe, is very well aligned, not through its specific technology of a bit of racing car, yeah, versus absolutely. Bit, but from its problem solving and its sort of cultural problem solution approach. Because once you've got a clear definition of the problem, you can put all the resources you've got on it. And that's what we do well here. We, we're very good at, we put a lot of effort into defining the problem. So maybe 20, 30 people are defined the problem, and then you can put a thousand people on, on solving it. And that really scales up your ability to respond. You know, you have some of the, without doubt, the best engineers in the world. They're just drawn to Formula One. So they've got to be clever people one way or the well, other. We've got a very strong workforce at, at, at all levels in the organization. And they're all really motivated and driven because they, can, they handle change well. They, yeah. they handle yeah. that challenge of change. And change can be scary for some people. Change can be great opportunities for others. Uh, but going back to your earlier point, we've got both a technical challenge here and we've also got a behavioural challenge. And yes. What we need to make sure is the technical solutions are, are credible and support the behavioural challenges. Mm. There'll probably be other technologies out there that we don't know about that mm. are just waiting in the, in the sidelines because this wasn't a focus. Sometimes when there's a focus on something, then all of a sudden things come out of the woodwork and you go, yes. oh, didn't, what about this old process that was developed for something in the past that can now be mixed with this other process and potentially increase those, um, those efficiencies? Yeah. As I mentioned before, I think that we need to be authentic, so we need to do our part as well. Um, and that means pushing ourselves to be benchmarked from a motorsport perspective in being as sustainable as we possibly can be, as employing sustainable practices and, and, and making sure that those are driven through to implementation. You know, we, we literally can't afford to be complacent. You know, it's always got to be better, better, better all the time. A number of criticisms about our responses to climate change are, well, it's not enough, it's not going to make a difference. Mm. Well, that shouldn't in itself, in itself stop you doing that, as long as you remember that having done that Steps step, forward. <laughs> yeah, you've got to yeah. keep doing the next steps. Absolutely. Where how far can and how fast can we push the behavioural challenges and how quickly can we bring technology that will enable those behavioural challenges to be effective. Mm. It isn't just racing on a Sunday afternoon that's exciting and glamorous and all of those things. There is a heck of a lot more to it. So one of my key ambitions in, in making this sort of small documentary is to ensure that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because you've just described a lot of what that baby is. You know, there's, there's a lot to cherish in all of that. I don't know about you, but I found those conversations truly enlightening and inspiring. To my mind, there is clearly so much talent here that we should tap into to not only develop and progress great racing, but to illustrate how best in class teamwork can fix things fast. So however it all shakes down, I'm really excited about the prospect of motorsport in the electric age.